Hi, welcome to Priority Zero, a lead dev engineering leadership podcast. I'm your host, Scott Carey, and today I'm joined by Rafe Colburn. Rafe, so good to have you with us today. Can you just tell us a little bit about what you do? Yeah, sure. I'm the Chief Product and Technology Officer at Depop. Uh, if you don't know, Depop is, a, is an online marketplace, uh, consumer to consumer, mostly for clothing. Um, and, uh, and yeah, so, so I started there as the Chief Product Officer, but my background is really engineering. I was an engineer for a very long time. Came over as Chief Product Officer and then moved into the CPTO role, I guess about a, a year and a half ago and so, um, or maybe a year ago. And so, yeah, basically anything we deliver software-wise kind of falls under my remit. Nice, and we are definitely going to get to that chief product officer engineering, kind of how that all fits together a little bit later on. But I want to go all the way back. How did you get into engineering in the first place? Oh, you know, I mean, I think, uh, I think my story, because I've, I've been, gosh, I entered the industry probably 1995, so a long time ago now. Uh, and, you know, I was a kid who loved computers. You know, I think that was such a common background in kind of the very early era of the internet. You know, people, it was more of a hobby, less of a, like, profession. I'm definitely in that generation. And so, uh, you know, messing around with computers was kind of what I did with all my free time anyway. And so, you know, it seemed logical to get a job there. And, and uh, I just happened to, uh, I knew a friend who had moved to another U.S. state to take a job at a startup. They had kind of an opening for a jack of all trades type person there. I did some QA tech writing, system administration, just a bunch of different stuff. Uh, and uh, yeah, started there, started there at the bottom. What was your first machine you were tinkering with? Oh, Commodore 64, yeah. Nice. Uh, basic? <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. 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 Um, we've had loads of people on the podcast talking about kind of learning through basic and like what that teaches you and like the kind of frustration of banging your head against the wall. And then we've had other like engineers who've come up a little bit later on and they put mostly learning like Java and things. And it's right, like a right. Very different experience. Yep. And then like with another guest we got into, like what is this like AI assisted version of coding mean for that next generation that's coming through, which is like as far away from learning basic probably as you can get where you like learn it all by like doing it over and over and over again. Yeah, absolutely. So at what point did like the tinkering with the Commodore um, like turn into something where you were like, oh, I can actually make a career out of this? Uh, so I'd gone to, to college and uh, I was actually studying journalism. I had been like the editor of the high school newspaper and I was really into it. Um, and I guess there were, uh, but, uh, but I was always really, really interested in computers. Uh, and I did my first year of college and I was like, ah, I don't think I want to be a journalist, uh, mainly because I didn't want to interview people actually. Yeah. Uh, it's like, you know, to have to go like call people and ask them to interview just was not my jam. Uh, and so, uh, and so like the next most likely thing seemed to be, you know, something with computers. So I switched to that. So you did computer science? Uh, management information systems, actually. So it's basically, you know, if you're too lazy to take the hard math classes, you do this other degree, you can still get a career. It was in the business college. Where do you study? Uh, University of Houston. Okay, nice. Yep. Um, you definitely picked the more lucrative of those two career paths. Uh, <laughs> yeah, for take sure. It, take it from me. Yeah. Um, it's so funny how, like, I wouldn't see those two career paths being in any way linked, but the, like, sheer number of engineers I talk to that have an interest or have, like, pursued journalism at some point, uh, maybe they're just the people that want to come on a podcast, but there's definitely some like correlation there that I need to investigate. Um, so you come out of college, yeah, you talked about that first role. Like, how did the first kind of few years of your career go? Because I think you said you entered the industry in '95. Yep. Interesting time to be entering the yes. industry. You had yeah. more like five good years and then some bad years. Yeah, it was really funny because I guess at that first job, one thing was uh, I used the internet a lot in college, you know, but like there was no web really. We used IRC and other things, uh, you know, FTP sites. We were really into FTP sites, if anyone remembers those. Uh, and the web sort of, you know, I think probably w before I started this job, they had the uh, oh, oh, Mosaic, the original, the browser that led to, to Netscape. Netscape came out just when I started my professional career. And so, you know, I kind of got into web stuff immediately as soon as it came out, you know, worked on the website for the company, kind of got into that. I had no way of knowing it was going to be this huge thing. And so um, the company was eventually bought by Netscape. I didn't go work for Netscape, which honestly was a huge career mistake. But uh, Is that Mark Andreessen? Yeah, 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 exactly. And uh, uh, 
I went and did something else. Basically, I wanted to work for like a web design firm, so I did that for a few years. Uh, and, and then I guess gradually got more to the application development side of it. Uh, and probably the same time, maybe late 90s, I knew someone who wrote computer books, and I was like, oh, this seems like something I could do. I had done a bunch of tech writing, and so my kind of side hustle was writing computer books, which probably, did, it was not very lucrative, I can say, but, uh, but I learned a lot, like, because I, I would go home and learn subjects deeply after work. So uh, I won't say my work-life balance was particularly good, but like, I, it was a really, really educational. Uh, and yeah, I had worked at, mostly at consulting firms uh, through 2000. I had, in 2000, I was working for a small startup. Uh, and uh, <laughs> I was just thinking about it the other day because of the kind of current times. Uh, a company agreed to buy the startup I worked at, and... Uh, had bought a Super Bowl ad, and then uh, they basically shut down and canceled the acquisition the next day, which was like a mortal blow to the company I work for, and uh, yeah, a tough time. It was, it was a tough time uh, economically. Yeah, I mean, we had a bunch of uh, kind of crypto companies with the Super Bowl ads simply yeah. at the wrong time, so yep. yeah, yep. People, have, people have made that mistake before. A, a long tradition in tech, like, you know, <laughs> when, they're, when all the Super Bowl ads are tech ads, maybe it's time to, 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 to know, get out of there. Yeah. Um, it's so funny though. Like, there's like, have you ever seen the show um, Halt and Catch Fire? Yes. Because like, there's so many like parallels there. Because obviously they're like building the search engine alongside Google, and then they like they could join Netscape, but they don't. And obviously it's that Texas kind of Texas. Yeah, scene absolutely. Thing, so, yeah, um, really good show. I really like great it. Great show. Yeah. For yeah. anyone who's not seen it, highly recommend. Um, so you kind of shifted into that. Yeah, you were doing the tech writing. Like, what what was the next step after that? What what was the um, next engineering gig? So the kind of first real getting paid to do software development and not things that were software development adjacent. Uh, and I did a lot of programming as a kid. I had just not come in that, that way into, at the beginning of my career. Uh, was I worked for a, a consulting firm and uh, I applied for a job and it was really like a front end job. They had hired someone else for that, but they knew I had written a book about CGI programming and other great blasts from the past. I'm like, oh, would you like this kind of senior role as a as a uh, application developer on the web? I took that job, and so really for a couple of years, it was it was like custom app development for a bunch of a bunch of different like corporate clients, basically. Yeah, so you're doing a lot by doing. Yep. You're kind of like jumping from loads of different jobs. So you're kind of like picking up all these skills as you go along. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, and I, I actually. It's funny, I think probably the number one thing I learned, I learned in that job was, uh, was basically that, you know, you have to be willing to both discard and acquire skills in this job. Like, I think if you become attached, like we would get another client, we would go start working on it. You know, the technology landscape was really evolving in that time, like ASP had just come out and there was Cold Fusion and there was this and there was that, just the beginning of Java web application development. And so, uh, you know, you kind of had to pick up the skills you needed to do for the needed for the client. That said, I don't think deep skills were demanded. I don't think the apps were very complex back then. But um, you know, scalability was generally not an issue. But uh, it was nice to kind of. I don't know if it was nice or not, but uh, it was a good. I think it was good training to say like it's it's more about the ability to acquire skills and figure out how to apply them to problems than it is about developing some deep specialization. And so at that time, you're like the quintessential individual contributor, right? Yeah. You're doing a lot of gathering of requirements. You're just kind of going from like application to application, acquiring all these skills. Like, when did you start to kind of really feel like you were like on a professional track with that? Mm -hmm. I think, uh, you know, I really, it was consulting and I really liked consulting. And one of the things I liked about it was you did work with stakeholders, you did talk to the customers and you did, did do some of these other things. And so, you know, I never really worked on a team as an engineer with an engineering manager and someone makes a list of tickets to do. It was a, it was a lot more self-directed. Generally, the projects were not that many people, maybe two or three. Uh, and so it was kind of the full spectrum of like getting to build things. It wasn't, it wasn't you know, just do things on, on this list. Uh, and, you know, I think probably, you know, there were definitely management positions. There were managers. Um, and I didn't, I didn't really think too much about management. I think probably, you know, again, back in the olden days, there wasn't really an IC track either. It was just kind of like, you're a consultant or you're a senior consultant or you're whatever. Um, and, you know, and, and I didn't, yeah, I didn't, I didn't think that much about management at first, really, other than, you know, other people moving to management. It's like, why are they a manager? Am I not a manager? Should I be a manager? These kinds of things. Uh, but if we, you know, 
I, not to skip over a bunch, but I'll just like foreshadow and say, I really was in IC for a long time before I became a manager, probably first 10 or 15 years of my career, I was in IC and then I kind of switched to management, I guess late by today's standards, I don't know. Yeah, maybe, but like, I think like you're, you're right in terms of like, the, that was the way the industry was kind of moving, like man engineering manager in particular hadn't really become like a discipline, like we think of it now, like it, it weren't like the, there wasn't the literature on it, there wasn't the structure, there wasn't like the ways of thinking about the way that you organize engineering teams that we have now. So it's not that surprising, but then like, what happened? Like you didn't just wake up one morning as a manager. Like, did you kind of pursue that track on purpose or did you get thrust into it? Um, gosh, I'm trying to think like, what was that, that first management position? I think, um, you know, I applied for a job as a manager. So, so I guess, um, uh, let's see, I'm trying to think. So after the first, dot com bust. Like it was just hard to get a job. I certainly wasn't looking for management jobs. I would have taken any job that would pay my rent. Any job, yeah. And and uh Were you in New York at this point? No, in North Carolina actually. Uh, and uh so I you know I found a job. It was really, really boring. So boring. It was like doing security code review for the US Postal Service. Such a drag. <laughs> um how and, did you uh, do that for? Got about six months. Okay. And uh and in the meantime I uh a friend of mine had, was involved with a tiny startup. They needed a Java developer to kind of build some new backend services. And so I started doing that part time. Eventually, uh, I think we were laid off from the post office, which was great. I switched to full time at this other job, uh, at, the, at this other job at a startup. And uh, it was really fun because we were building a real product, very back end heavy. And I kind of got to build the whole thing myself. Uh, and then we, I hired a couple of other people I didn't really manage, but I was kind of the tech lead. You know, I had been the, you know, the lead developer, I designed most of it. I hesitate to use the word architect. Uh, and uh, so when we brought other people on, we brought on some people who I knew as part-time people. And so uh, so there was some management-esque stuff there. But in the end, I wasn't really in a hurry to, uh, to like, have a proper management job because, uh, like, the individual contributor work was really interesting to sort of really get to work on your own thing. I had built it from the ground up. Super fun. Um, and then... I guess I began to uh, experience doubts about how the company was doing. Um, and, there, oh, and, then, and there had been some, I guess, personnel changes maybe. So I, uh, I applied for a job uh, that was a kind of tech lead-ish, management-ish position. Uh, and so that was really, the, I got the job. Uh, and that was really the first job where I had, you know, even like any kind of official management responsibilities. Uh, you know, and part of it was like it paid better than the other jobs I was applying for. Part of it was I wanted to give it a shot in management. Uh, the work seemed interesting, so I was interested in the project. And so, you know, it's kind of like I found myself in management because this was the job opportunity that looked most interesting to me at the time. Yeah, but how jarring was the actual management aspect of it when you got there? I mean, I was terrible at it, if I'm being honest. I think, uh, you know, and I think... I just, and what I'll say about that is, you know, I think this is probably, as you, as you said, you know, we really went through this transition with engineering management, you know, and I, and I would almost say like, that's almost like a pre-RANS and post-RANS era where I think maybe in the Silicon Valley and in, in Seattle, there was this like proper engineering management function that had been going on for decades, but the rest of the country, we just had no idea what was even going on, you know? Do you, like, do you want to explain that pre-RANS, post-RANS? Yeah, absolutely. Know. So there's this blog, RANS in Repose. He eventually wrote a really famous book and he basically really laid out in real detail, like what people need from their managers, what engineers need from an engineering manager, kind of what the job really is. And, you know, explained it as a real craft, a job you can be good at. I think before that, it was kind of like, you're also an engineer, but you tell other people what to do, I think was basically the expectation of what an engineering manager was, which is the approach I took to the job, for sure, um, in, in my first couple of management roles. Yeah, then we got Camille Fournier doing the manager's path. Yeah, we got Will yeah. Larson. We got Project Oxygen at Google. It all started to... There was yeah, just oh, more absolutely. Literature. I mean, it was a Cambrian explosion from that point. Yeah. One, because, I mean, to Rand's credit, he became super famous. Yeah. And it became like this sort of... It was also, I would say, that was like the great heyday of blogging as well. And so lots of people had blogs. I have a blog. Everybody had a blog. Uh, and one of the things people really started writing these blogs about was engineering management. And there was such a hunger for it because the tech industry was growing again. And people were moving to these management roles and like, what is the actual job? And so, so that, that felt like a big inflection point. Uh, 
but for me, yeah, in that first job, you know, I didn't, you know, and I think it was, I just really struggled. The thing I struggled, I think, the most with was kind of what should I do myself? What should I delegate to other people? You know, uh, how much guidance should I give people? Am I here to tell people what to do or, you know, and, and I, and I think, you know, uh, you know, my manager had no idea whatsoever how to coach me on any of these things. So, you know, I feel bad. These people are basically my early human experiments. You know, I, I tried things, some worked, some didn't. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and like, yeah, there wasn't the literature on it. Like, were you kind of learning through the blogs? Like, was that like... I think some, to some degree, and, you know, probably going by instinct, you know. Uh, you know, try not to do what bosses who had annoyed you in the past did. <laughs> and, and, you know, there were not many amazing examples where I was like, oh, I just need to be like so-and-so. And so, uh, yeah, it was, it was a lot of trial and error, and for sure reading. But to be honest, like... Unless you've done it a while, it's kind of hard to apply the literature. Like, I see this all the time, brand new managers, and they're trying to, like, follow the literature, but, like, they look like someone who's following the literature rather than someone who has a feel for the job, and I 100% was that person. So, yeah, you're kind of, like, doing it on instinct. I think that there's, like, a spectrum there. You can either, like, do it by the book or you do it by instinct. I think a good manager probably wants a little bit of a mix of two. Like, I'm definitely like you. I tend to do it a bit more on instinct, but if I struggle, I'm, like, going to go and try and find a way of doing it. Um, and as you said, like there was much more of that available to you when you were starting to get into that, starting to go down that path. But you were saying that like you basically wanted to manage, like you were managed by good managers. Like what did you pick up from? Oh no, I was saying sorry that I was not managed by good managers. I mostly picked up. Actually, that's not true. I sh that's too harsh. I, I had a manager I really liked working with before that. Uh, but he wasn't an engineer. He was kind of the product leader. And so it was like full autonomy on the engineering front. You know, we would chat, you know, because it was such a small company, you know, a lot about just figuring out what our shared goals were and what we wanted to deliver. And, and uh, you know, he was super transparent. And, uh, you know, so at least I think, you know, he brought a really kind of personable approach to that job that I appreciated and was like a good, you know, and I think kind of a manager as a collaborator rather than like as your boss, which I really liked. Yeah, it's kind of that like golden rule, but for management is like, how do I want to be treated? That's how I want to manage other people. Yeah, and yeah. You mentioned autonomy. You mentioned kind of like definitely being a little bit more connected. Like, are those still things that you kind of take as your management like thesis? Yeah, I mean, I think a thousand percent on that. You know, I, I, uh, I mean, you know, it's funny. This is. Even to this day, I think, generally speaking, I don't really love being told what to do. Uh, and, I don't think uh, many engineers do. No, right. I mean, it's kind of a, it's kind of a, you know, I always tell people, like, I can channel the inner staff engineer when I'm feeling skeptical or whatever. And even though I haven't been an IC engineer for a long time now, you know, but I think that, uh, yeah, so I try and confer that onto other people. And, like, you know, I take a much more kind of coaching oriented style, you know, I mean, I feel like the number of times I say this, you know, it's like probably you've already thought of this, but what if we tried that? And the truth of the matter is 80, 90% of the time people have already thought about that. And so I'm not bringing them anything novel. They just need that nudge. Uh, you know, or, may, or maybe they even don't. I just want to make sure that the idea sort of is getting an, is getting a, a hearing, but usually people have thought of it, um, which is good. I think that's, I think that's great. And so, you know, I think, and I think mostly like I'd much rather sort of, you know, have some kind of North Star, some kind of vision, some kind of goal we're aiming at, some way to measure it, and then give people lots of autonomy in terms of how they pursue that goal. Uh, you know, and they can check it, and then I'm a tool for them to achieve that goal. You know, what do you need from me? I'll, I'll be happy to help. Uh, but, like, my job's not to drag you there. You're going there, and, you know, uh, bring me into it when you need to is is uh, always how I prefer it. And of course, like performance management is real. Sometimes people need a lot more help than that. Some pe sometimes, you know, you do have to say, oh, these decisions are not, are not that great to me. Like, please explain them to me or here's what I think you should do instead. But, you know, I kind of see that as a last resort rather than the kind of like opening way yeah. to go about it. And how have you adapted to those kind of much more uncomfortable parts of the job? Uh, I mean, I think it's a really good question. And, uh, you know, it, it, the truth of the matter is like so much of it is practice. And, and I think I remember, you know, I, it, one of the classic examples that's so hard for new managers is uh, people want to talk about their salary or getting promoted, but especially salary, you know, and, and for me always, I do not want to talk about my salary with my boss under any circumstances. I hate it. If I bring it up in a one-on-one, -on -one, like if they could read my mind, what they would know is like this guy's been mad about this for months, <laughs> you know, which has not happened to me for a long time yeah. to be fair. But early in my career, like 
you know, there were times when I was like, I'm not sure I'm being paid fairly or whatever else. And I wouldn't talk about it, wouldn't talk about it. Eventually I did. I was already frustrated, you know, and so, but I can also remember becoming a manager and the first time someone sits down with you and they say, hey, I want to talk about my salary. <laughs> you know, uh, you know, I always say the first thing of management is projection. And like you're saying, you're like, I hate talking about this. So I know they're probably already upset with me. And I don't really know what to say because I don't have the answers from HR anyway. I can't give you an amazing answer right now. And so, you know, the, the panic sets in, you know, and, and, and I think, uh, and I do know it's hard for people to talk about. So I eventually just got to the point where I would tell people, you know, they sit down, they want to talk about their salary and you can tell they're nervous. And, and I tell them like, look, if everyone on the team talks to me about their salary once or twice per year, it means I talk about it like every week. And so it's nothing to me. I'm happy to talk about it. But like, you can only say that once you've talked about it for people, with people dozens of times, it doesn't trigger you anymore. You can have a rational conversation about it. And so a lot of that is just kind of getting the, the practice of these things. In. Yeah, you know, you it's know, hard for everybody like, at first. You know what you can say, you know how you can manage that, you know where you need to go to get the answers you can get. I think like, do you kind of default to transparency there where it's just like, look, like I need to take this away and, and come back to you with some, some answers? Or? Yeah, absolutely. I think, and, and also just knowing how people react to things. And, and I think a couple of things about that. One is definitely I did get into the good habit of if I can't really talk about it right now, I need to do some research you know, to be able to say, I would love to talk to you about it, but let's bring it back up at our next one-on-one -on -one so I can do a little bit of homework rather than feeling the pressure to give an answer right away. And then I think the flip side is, you know, how people react in the moment is not sort of the real way they react to any kind of feedback, whether it's they're not getting the raise they want or they could be doing better. And so even if they seem to be getting a little bit triggered in the moment, you know, I try not to get triggered myself. I say, okay, well, I'm going to let them like, you know, think about it for a week and they come back. If they're still upset about it, we can get into it. But a huge amount of the time, like, okay, I thought about it over the week and I kind of understand where we're coming from or these are the things I still need cleared up. So, you know, time helps yeah, <laughs> yeah, in a yeah, lot of cases. Definitely. Yeah, and I think about patience as a manager, like, because I, I think when you're early in your management career, you want to be able to fix every problem. Mm -hmm. You want to be able to solve everything for everyone. Yeah, and everyone to be happy the whole time. And I think then you have to get a bit comfortable with the fact that that, that can't be tr the case. Like, yeah, no, I, yeah, I couldn't agree more. I think it's, you know, and it's, it's even, that, of course, you want people to be happy, but, you know, I think all of us, it's probably biological. The experience of making someone unhappy is so stressful, you know, and, and I think, you know, when you're in management, it feels like you're always making somebody unhappy. You say we're going to prioritize, we're going to prioritize, you know, this and not that one person's happy because their thing got prioritized and one person's unhappy because theirs wasn't prioritized or we're promoting this person and that, that person, you get one happy and one unhappy person. And so, you know, I think, all, or maybe many unhappy people, if they all thought they should have been promoted. And I think, you know, I think to be able to like, uh, you know, another thing I say sometimes is like, I do, a, I do my best every day and I forgive myself every night because, you know, just there's always a, some kind of disappointment that you're, that you're inflicting at work if you have to make decisions. And I think it's a, uh, I think it's a hard transition from an IC where basically you have tasks to, to do. If you do them in a timely fashion, everybody's happy. That's what you've been asked to do. Yeah. Management's kind of a trade-offs job. And so there's always a, uh, you know, some unpleasantness to, to kind of process. Yeah, J James Stanier just wrote a great blog post on um, the engineering manager on his Substack. Uh, I'll try and remember to include it in the show notes, but it was really about that exact thing. It was like disappointing people is part of the job of management. And once you get comfortable with that, you can get better at it. And also there is like this, like um, I can't remember his exact phrasing, but there's like a vista of disappointment. And the longer you wait, or the less transparent you are, the worse. Uh, yeah, I couldn't agree more with that. I mean, sometimes I tell people like, my real job is just minimize aggregate disappointment. You know, I think <laughs> because there's always some, how do I smooth it out and not make it as bad as it otherwise could be? But, but I agree, you know. And, and I mean, I think again, like promotions, they're always a hot topic. You know, people would always rather find out they're not getting promoted six months before the promotion period and what they need to work on rather than the day when promotions are announced. And so if you know and you don't tell people, you're probably making it worse. I think that's, that's a really good thing to live by. Um, and so at some point you ended up landing at Etsy, right? Yes. Yes. Um, well, tell me about that. How did you land there? Yeah. I mean, that was probably of all the things I did in my career, it was the, you know, probably the most significant, uh, I had been working. So I had left that company, the small company that, that I had built almost everything, gone to another job, went up going back and working there. And, uh, I mean, I still remember this, uh, 
you know, my manager had left. They brought a new guy in. He was bringing other people in from his old job. And I was interviewing one of them. I knew the interview didn't matter, like, because he's going to hire his friend from his old job. And uh, this guy asked me, like, you know, what's your favorite thing about working here? Not in a very interested fashion. That's just like, hey, do you have any questions for me? What's the best thing about working here? And I was like, oh, my God, I'm stumped. What am I doing with my life? <laughs> and, so, and so I said, I'm going to go get a job at a company I really want to work for. Um, it's funny. I didn't actually know a whole lot about Etsy as a business. I don't know why they hired me in the first place, because they were really into people who were into Etsy. Uh, but I knew some people from the engineering team. And at that time, this is, gosh, 2011, when I was interviewing there, Etsy was really on the forefront of continuous deployment, observability, like, I mean, so many tools that people just use today, whether it's LaunchDarkly or Datadog or some of these other things, really, Etsy was doing that in practice then at the time before anybody else, which I was, I was fascinated by. You know, my old company had like a quarterly release cycle, and I was like, no, I want to put code in production every day. I and knew that were, Etsy was a place I could do that. And they were blogging about it. So you they were knew, blogging about yeah. it. That's how I knew. And, you know, I was on, I don't know, AIM or something with someone who worked there. And he's telling me about a new deployment tool he was building. It just sounded like, you know, a lot of innovation was happening there, really on the ways of working front, almost more than the technology front. It sounded interesting. So I applied for a job there. Uh, and, uh, and, yeah, they hired me, which was great. I uh, actually did take a job as an IC there. They didn't, they had very few engineering managers at the time. I wasn't even sure I really wanted to be an engineering manager. Uh, I had done a couple of management roles and gone back and forth. Uh, but I really wanted to work at Etsy, and the IC role was the one that was available, and so that's the one I took. Uh, um, and how long did you, well, so for people that don't know, Etsy acquired Depop, didn't they? Yes, they did. So, yeah, I was there 10 years, started in January of 2012, and then moved to Depop end of 2021. So like just almost 10 years at Etsy. Yeah. And um, what was the biggest thing you learned at Etsy? Because they're, they're, as you mentioned, like their engineering culture is like really well regarded. And um, yeah, what, what, what did you pick up while you were there? Oh gosh. I mean, uh, yeah, we could do a whole po podcast about that. But I think, you know, at the end of the day, uh, yeah, I'll say, I'll say maybe two things. I think one is, uh, you know, I learned a lot about diversity when I started at Etsy. Uh, I think out of 100 people in engineering, there were uh, uh, two women out of the whole group, you know, 2%. And when I left, it was probably more than a third, maybe close to half uh, on the gender split. And so uh, it was really interesting to see how the company evolved as it became more diverse. Uh, I think that was all positive. Um, and... Uh, so and is that a really conscious decision from the Super business? conscious decision. Um, there, was a, there was a guy who was a VP of engineering there named Mark Hedlund. He's like a pretty famous person in the industry. Uh, and he just kind of made it his priority, you know? And I think, uh, um, you know, he did some interesting things there. But I think, honestly, just setting that from the top and saying, like, we are going to be a more diverse engineering team. I care a lot about it. Uh, you know, it just put it in people's heads. Like, hey, try to... You know, you know, make diversity a, a concern when you're hiring. You know, there were no quotas or anything like that. The expectation was that, like, you know, though, that if you just brought a series of non-diverse candidates in, you know, you were not doing your job well, and that and that really was enough. Um, and so, so that was a, a, you know, I think that that was really, really, you know, valuable for me. And, and it's really funny. I think way back, the very first job I ever had had a shockingly diverse team. Uh, for its age. And it was really good. It was really good. There was one engineering manager at the whole company. She was a, a, a woman and, and uh, uh, you know, that we had some, uh, some women in engineering. And so then I went through a long drought of like, okay, there are no women in engineering at these other places. Um, and I think, uh, but anyway, I, so I think just like uh, the, learned a lot about diversity. And then I think... I think just before you move on, the, yeah. like quantifying the impact of that is so difficult to do. I find that when we talk about it, like it's really difficult to kind of get to the nub of like why that's the first thing that came into your head. But I think that like you're kind of, what you're kind of saying is like, you know it when you see it. And I think when you're on that diverse team, you just yep. realize that it's a better way to work. Uh, you know, and what I would say is, you know, regardless of why, I would say the biggest... The biggest impact was it just diversified the communication styles across the team. You know, I think 
I think, you know, when it's all guys, they have all kind of come up the same way. You know, you get a real monoculture of, of communication. And I think just, just having people who bring different communication styles, I think really open things up. I think, uh, you know, tons of really positive side effects, but I do think it just kind of like leveled up the communication in the business so much. Uh, also in part, just because you don't walk into a conversation with people and make tons of assumptions because there's a more diverse group. And so, you know, I know there's like real studies and people have lots of academic things to say about it, but I, I will say that like, I felt it very strongly as the, you know, we went through all the phases where like, I felt bad for the, when we only had a few women working there, people put them on every single engineering panel. I know that was like terrible and, uh, you know, probably, <laughs> you know, painful emotional labor and all of, all of those things. But it was a step on the journey to where it was like, Diversity was just kind of an aspect of the business and not something we constantly had to like, uh, you know, chip away at. Yeah, every yeah, day. yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it was never going to happen overnight, but it's awesome that they did that. Yeah, yeah, I, I, yeah, I think so too. And then, um, you know, the other, maybe the other funny thing about Etsy that I would say that I learned from Etsy was, uh, you know, technology choices weren't as important as I thought they were. And a bunch of choices weren't as important as I thought they were, you know. Probably, um, probably not worth the amount of time and energy that was going yeah, into making those decisions. absolutely. I mean, I think, you know, I think Etsy is so much about, can you do things fast and does everyone do them in a consistent fashion? And, you know, and that we use some technology for it. But, but, you know, so many people would even take a job at Etsy and they'd come in and be like, oh, the tech stack here is terrible. But then they became really productive engineers at Etsy on a very, you know, terrible tech stack. And so, uh, you know, I wouldn't say don't put any thought into it, but I think, you know, be really good at using the technology you use is vastly more important than choosing technology A over technology B. It's always so tempting, I think, for, for engineers to do that when they go in. But like, I've heard so many cases now where people will just turn around and go like, okay, build me a case for your thing being better than this thing by enough that we, it warrants moving it. And then that stops a lot of people in their tracks. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's funny. I know I, know, uh, I heard of, uh, uh, you know, like this sort of like internal engineering surveys, uh, you know, for engineering sentiment. You know, I think this is probably like the malign influence of the net promoter score. But I think the question was actually, how likely would you be to, prom to uh, recommend the tech stack we use to another company? And it's like, no engineer, like that score is going to be one and it does not matter what the company's tech stack is. You would never do it the same way as your current job. And, and, and so I only assumed that the person who wrote the question had no idea that engineers are always going to say it's terrible to that question. Our tech <laughs> stack is bad. I know all the problems, you know. Uh, do you want another job? No, I'm happy to stick with this. Uh, you know, so I think that's the weird like dichotomy of the whole thing. Awesome. So this is called priority zero. So we want to talk about that one thing that's right at the top of your list. What's yep. your priority zero right now? Uh, my priority zero right now is, I do think, sort of reaching for a higher level of execution across, across product and engineering. Um, and actually not because things are going poorly. Things are going well. We've, they've gone really well for the past couple of years. I think... Uh, so I, you know, I spent, I spent my first year at Depop really as the chief product officer, you know, really kind of learning the product part of the business a little bit, uh, learning how to work with product managers every day and not really engineers. I really tried to stay in my lane and not annoy the engineering team because that wasn't my job. And then, you know, there was a sort of transitional year where I was getting familiar with engineering, kind of collecting data, still focusing on all the product stuff that still has to be done. And, uh, I think I finally have the headspace now to say, okay, how can I, how to, how to get the whole system really working well together and what do we need from each function? What can they be doing better? How can they better collaborate? And so really that's been my priority zero probably for the past couple of months. Yeah, it kind of comes with the job title, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. yeah so really you're focusing on that intersection between product and engineering. I think, I think that and at the same time, really taking a deeper dive into how we do things in engineering. You know, I think... Uh, and I think, you know, we have this discussion in this industry, engineering productivity, people are talking about it everywhere. How do you measure it? And all these other things. And, uh, you know, it really is like the layers of an onion, you know, I can give you a bunch of different ways to get to it. But at the end of the day, if you really want to know what's going on, uh, you have to like look at pull requests and see what people are really doing. And so I've kind of gotten into that, like, look at pull requests and see how things really work, stage of things, which is a luxury. I was a little bit, I felt like I was a little bit too busy for that. But, uh, but uh, you know, my curiosity has been peaked. So now I'm really kind of investigating things a little more. Yeah, where are you seeing the kind of biggest friction points that you can kind of start to attack? Yeah, I mean, I think, I think one of them is, is a classic. Uh, 
you know, maybe it's made a little easier that there's not like some kind of CTO, CPO conflict other than in my own head. Uh, but it's that, you know, we do have some long-term things we need to address in engineering, uh, you know, whether they're about scalability or observability or some other things, you know, and, or like migrations that go on for a long time. And how do we balance that with our, our, uh, our product priorities? You know, the, the reward for doing well is greater expectations. And so, you know, I think, I think there's always, you know, even more self-imposed pressure to exceed what you've done in the past. Uh, and then, and then, you know, I think sometimes it can feel like the engineering priorities get left out there. And so it's, so it's just that prioritization. Um, and, uh, that, that is probably the main thing that I think is a source of friction between, between product and engineering. And then probably the other thing that, uh, is really hard and it's a little bit between product and engineering, a little bit between teams is, uh, you know, Depop has an Android app and an iOS app and a website and we're not big enough and it wouldn't be efficient to have, <laughs> backend engineers, iOS engineers, web engineers, and Android engineers on every team. So, you know, just there wind up being cross team things, which is like, we would love to launch this, but it doesn't exist on Android yet. And when is the Android team going to build this thing so that we can launch it? And so there's, you know, I try and minimize that through our, through our product choices, how we build the product, but, uh, but there are always some of it. And so that inevitably leads to some inefficiency and people waiting and people getting a little frustrated. Yeah. I mean, we didn't even talk about how you ended up becoming a product person. I guess that's an important step here. Like, how, how did you end up acquiring the product part of your job title? Yeah, I mean, maybe this is the weirdest part of the whole story. It's kind of funny. Uh, so I had, uh, I had been working at Etsy for a really long time. We just acquired, uh, I was a VP of engineering and was managing, you know, kind of three or four directors. Uh, Etsy had just acquired Depop and they asked me and three other people uh, one person from engineering me, uh, uh, this guy, Nick, who's now the CPO of Etsy. Um, and then a person from analytics and a person from marketing to kind of like go consult with Depop and, you know, figure out what they can learn from Etsy and how they can, how they can build things better. So we spent a few months, never came to the UK. It was kind of late pandemic. So it was all over Google meet, uh, just kind of talking to the teams there, really to the leadership. We didn't really go too deep, giving, giving them some ideas that may or may not work for them. Um, and, and someone, and they were hiring a CPO. So they, they had a, a search on, um, and someone suggested that I would be a candidate for that job, which is really weird. It's like, do you know, Nick, he's the product person here. Uh, I talked to their CEO. She, the CEO at the time, she has since, she has since left. Uh, and, uh, you know, she was like, you know, basically what I told her from I was from engineering, not product. She was like, oh, this is unusual. I was like, I know, don't ask me. Uh, you know, you're not going to hurt my feelings if you say no. They were late in the recruiting cycle with another candidate. But, you know, and so I think like, we'll just go ahead and make an offer to the real product person. So the real product person dropped out four days before they were supposed to start. Uh, my boss gets on, <laughs> on the call with me. He's the CTO of Etsy. He says, you know, the CEO, Josh, wants to talk to you. And I was like, oh boy, I know what this is about. You know, do you, will you take this job at Depop? I knew why they wanted to talk to me. I was already at yes. Uh, so I said, sure, I'll take this job. And then it's, it was like, great, you start Monday. Uh, so yeah, just a weird thing that happened. Originally, it was like a six-month interim thing. Uh, and then it became permanent, I guess, like April of 2022. So um so honestly, I don't know. I don't know. Someone thought I would be able to do the job and <laughs> ask me if I would do it. And so I said, yes. I mean, there must have been something there. That's yeah, yeah. I mean, it's gone okay. So I can, I think at this point I can say they weren't wrong. But, uh, but it, it is funny, like, the funny thing about it is like, if the job had appeared, if a recruiter had pinged me about it, do you want to go be the CPO of Depop? I would have never applied in a million years. So, I mean, I guess I'm thankful to, I guess, you know, the Etsy executive team that they're like, oh, they saw something that I probably wouldn't have yeah. picked for myself. So I do appreciate that. It's been really fun. And that's probably what you do as a, as a manager and a leader too, right? But yeah, absolutely. Kind of like absolutely. A, a layer down. Yeah. I mean, I've definitely, you know, asked many people to do things that they're like, are you sure? And I'm like, yeah, I know. I feel, I feel pretty good about it. And I'll support you. It'll be okay. Yeah. And I think like, in the industry at large, like the, the tension between engineering and product can be like a little bit overblown. Like, have you found that? Like, how have you found that tension between those those two teams? Because I think it's an important way, and I think the way you're thinking about efficiency and driving things forward is your priority zero right now. Like, really digging into why that like um, assumption is there sometimes is probably an important part of it. Yeah, I mean, actually, you know, to some degree, I think that we come by that tension honestly. You know, and I think. I think part of it, I think there's kind of two misunderstandings that, that kind of drive it. Uh, I think one of them is, uh, 
it is just true that most product managers, unless they come back from, that, that they come from an engineering background, you know, they don't really understand the field, you know, and so it's a little bit like a person going to a mechanic when they don't know their car works, uh, how their car works, and they say, oh, this is what's wrong with your car, and they're like, I guess I have to say yes, right? Like, I, I, don't, I don't have an argument to make uh, on the contrary. I do wonder if things like ChatGPT, people go ask ChatGPT, how long should it take to do this? Uh, maybe you'll get a different answer. But I think by that's, and large, like that expertise is just not there. That's and horrifying so, too. So. <laughs> it kind of is, isn't it? And, uh, uh, you know, I think, and so I think some degree, product managers feel a little bit like they're flying blind, that the engineers, even though maybe the, you know, the product managers are accountable for delivering these outcomes, but the engineers are really the people who have the, the power to do yeah, it. The they're the ones on who that. write the code. Yeah. And so there's a big trust question there, which is like, do you trust engineers to, you know, really focus on building the thing you need or are they off playing with new technology or are they playing foosball or are they doing whatever? Like I think because you don't know yourself, it's hard to, it's hard to really trust them. And then I think the other side of it is, uh, you know, I don't know that engineers have the most empathy for product managers either sometimes too, which like they just tend to be very outcome focused. I actually love, I've really loved working with product managers because, you know, they are so oriented toward value creation. You know, you give them a goal and you say this goal is going to help the company succeed and then they go try and find ways to achieve this goal. So, but what they need is help from all the other supporting functions to choose the right way to achieve that goal. If they go on their own, they just don't know enough. You know, they may not be a designer, they're not analysts, they're not engineers, they're not data scientists. And so, you know, how do you build that whole squad? So even if the product manager is kind of uh, responsible for, for prioritizing the outcomes that they have the information they need and the input they need to actually make good choices and, and understand what's really involved. Yeah, so on that, like when, what needs to happen for this to no longer be your priority zero? Uh, gosh, I mean, that's a, that's a really good question. I think, uh, you know, I think probably, actually I'll say, I think the sort of like mark is, when do I think teams have really become more self-sufficient? I think maybe, maybe in some ways if I, if I really narrowed it down to one thing, it would be, you know, we just have way too many inter interdependencies and things sl slow people down. And so whether it's technology choices we need to make or ways of working choices or, or um, you know, whatever else it is that like when teams can really operate in the self more self-sufficient fashion and, and uh, kind of go as fast as they can under their own power, we'll be, we'll be better off. And so I think that's kind of what I'm looking for. Yeah, it's kind of the cliche, like managing yourself out of that process. Right? Yeah, yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, and Rafe, we always finish the episode on a recommendation. So is there anything you've seen, read, listened to recently that you want to recommend? Um, oh, yeah, I have one. I, I thought about this one. And I think uh, I've just downloaded this new app, Belly, B-E-L-I. And, and basically what it is is it's just a place to store all the restaurants you've been to, all the resta restaurants you want to you wanna go to. But there are two things I really like about it. One is it's global. And so if you go to a new city based on where you've eaten in cities you've been to, it will recommend restaurants. And the recommendations are pretty good. But what I like even more than that is that it's really built around stack ranking. So you stack rank all the restaurants, which is crazy. Like, you know, how do you, how do you rank Nando's versus a one Michelin star restaurant in Paris. But it asks you to like take up this challenge. And I think, I think that uh, it's funny, uh, Depop's old CTO, this, Guy Dan always said, like, you should always be able to stack rank anything. Uh, and so if nothing else, this is good practice to, uh, to be able to kind of think that through and, and come up with the stack ranking. It, like, it like makes your brain hurt a little bit to try and rank things against each other. So I sort of like the challenge of that. Yeah, I'm definitely going to look at that. I've definitely found myself like gravitating over the last couple of years to like all of these apps that just like track things. And then I'm a little bit like I've had a bit of a realization recently. It's like, why am I doing this? Like good reads for books. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, I'm a huge letterbox guy because I'm a movie mm, guy. Oh yeah, yeah, I've seen uh, that one. Like, like um, Vivino for wines. And then I'm just like, I never go back and look. Right, and I'm right. a little bit, I'm starting to question yeah. whether that's a good thing to do, but I'm definitely going to look at better. No, and I think Belly is exactly, I mean, I may be using it still in a year. I may be, have forgotten all of it and all this ranking that I've done is useless, but, but, uh, but it's fun to play with for a little while anyway. It's fun to think about the restaurants yeah. and trying to stack rank Nando's against a, a Michelin star restaurant is an interesting challenge at least. Yep, absolutely. Ray, thanks so much for coming on. Uh, all the best and... Uh, See you soon. Yeah, of course, my pleasure. Thanks. Thank you again for listening to Priority Zero, a lead dev podcast. Remember, you can get us wherever you get your podcasts, Apple, Spotify. But when you do, please remember to like and subscribe so you don't miss an episode. And we hope to see you at the next one.